Okay. Welcome, everybody. I can't see a lot of faces out there except for the panelists, but uh, I'm talking to you guys. My name is David Voth. I'm a producer here in Northeastern Nevada and a member of the Good Grazing Makes Sense team. Uh, just a background, uh, we run, manage a cow-calf operation, mostly on, uh, mostly on public ground, uh, largely on public ground. And I am smack dab in the middle of a drought, like I'm sure a lot of you guys are. So the Good Grazing Makes Sense team has put this, this together. Uh, those of you who are out there are, must be at least Facebook associates or somehow know about Good Grazing Makes Sense. We're going to talk about that in a while. But I want to welcome you. And uh, if you're here, you must be in a drought as well and uh, need to talk to some experts. I'm no expert, but we have one, two, three, four experts here to talk us through some of the ins and outs of managing through drought and making good decisions ahead of a drought. Uh, starting off, we have Shaley Stewart with DTN Livestock Market Analysis and, co and host of Cattle Market News, who will walk through the important market considerations during drought. Grace Woodmancy of UC Cooperative Extension will share ideas on creating a drought plan and further explain her drought decision support tool. Martin Townsend, a conservation coordinator with our uh, co-host Stewardship Alliance. Martin will speak to managing the range during the drought and discuss how RSA member Dale, who's now a panelist, thank you for coming Dale, uh, created this 15 step drought plan. And long before I got to meet Dale just a few minutes ago, I'd heard about this 15 step plan and I'm a analytical junkie and a cow junkie. So I'm, I'm really anxious to hear how you how you plan those 15 steps out and all the rabbit holes that go into planning something that big. And behind the scenes, uh, we have a couple of SRM members taking questions, taking questions live from Facebook and from YouTube. Uh, MJ and Kayla, thanks for taking care of that. Uh, keep me posted as questions come up. And for you guys out there, as questions arise, just, just pop them in the box and, and we'll get them answered as soon as possible. Uh, but before we get going, uh, a special thanks to Good Grazing Makes Sense who put this program on. Um, I'm a member of the Good Grazing Makes Sense program brought to you through the Society of Rangeland Management, which aims to provide practical, applicable, and economically feasible range management solutions, which can ultimately improve the productivity of the land and the bottom dollar of the ranch through conservation and collaboration between range scientists and ranchers. Um, I kind of stumbled into this good grazing makes sense thing on accident. Really, uh, I stumbled into good grazing on accident. I, uh, growing up, all I ever wanted to do was cowboy, and I thought that's what I would do my entire life. I was certain of it until the doctor told me that uh, I needed to make more money. My wife was pregnant, and we needed to do something just a little bit better. Uh, so I, I started learning a few of the next steps on management and I got really into grass and I thought, oh, the, the grass is what really takes care of these cows that I love. And then I realized, well, it's actually the soil that takes care of the grass that takes care of the cows that I love. And uh, here recently, since I've taken on this role as ranch manager, uh, I realized none of that matters if you can't make any money at it. You'll be, you'll be back cutting circles again and uh, probably end up in town working for somebody you don't want to work for. So so all that is to say that none of it, it all works together, the grass, the cows, the soil, and the money. And that's, to me, what good grazing makes sense is all about and uh, how they hooked me into being the moderator for tonight and being so involved with good grazing makes sense. Um, along those notes, uh, good grazing makes sense is uh, a program which you can, you can join for just $75 a year. Uh, we'll talk about some of the benefits later. Um, but one thing we're really trying to do is partner with those livestock organizations. We're trying to make that connection between the producer, the range scientists, and the, and the economists. Uh, that $75 a month gets you, one, newsletters, updates, videos, of which I'm the star of several, so uh, that might be worth it in itself. But better than that, you get uh, membership to the Society of Range Land Management, and that was when I joined SRM, that was a turning point for me. That's when I really started to understand that I don't know anything about the grass and the soil. And uh, there's a lot of people there that do. Um, 
tying the producer in with those kind of people is what we're, what we're really all about. Uh, for that membership, you get a list of rangeland consultants and uh, pretty unfettered access to a lot of great minds in rangeland science. Um, so think about it. That's certainly not the last pitch you'll hear about that tonight. Good Grazing Makes Sense is a great program that I encourage you to join. Uh, the Facebook alone, the, the good chats we have on Facebook, they're moderated, they're watched by some of these experts, and uh, it doesn't fall into a bunch of Facebook drama. It's real questions with real answers and, and really good dialogue. So with that, uh, I can't see who's out there, so, but I can see chats. Can I get a, a poll from, from whoever's out there? Can you, can you throw me what state you guys are in? MJ will, will be popping those up for me. Just uh, also loosens up your fingers and, and gets you prepped for answering those questions I know you're dying to ask. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the real experts and uh, I have a lot of questions of my own I wanna get answered. Can we, uh, can we have an intro from Shaylee? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll go ahead and take over the mic at this point. And uh, I first and foremost want to just thank everybody that's put this event together. I know it's a lot of groundwork behind the scenes. And like uh, you shared earlier, the conversation here is just going to be rich. And I'm so excited to be with like-minded people who really care about this industry, who really care about the business and really care about their legacy. And so they're willing to put in the hard work behind the scenes to make sure that they can preserve that way of life and their operations. So with that though, the cattle market is one that's complex all the time, let alone during drought situations. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just give you a little bit of good news because we have to take the wins when we get them, right? But we're gonna chat about just what happened today in the cattle market. So just to kind of get you uh, warmed up for the cattle market segment of this piece, I'm just going to share with you that it was a phenomenal day throughout the cattle market. The August live cattle contract closed $3.40 higher at $1.3752, which was a price point that's not been seen since April. The fat cattle market obviously latched onto that excitement and started to trade higher too. Upon evaluating show lists earlier this week and seeing that carcass weights are declining and that slaughter speeds are continuing to run aggressively both on fed cattle and on beef cows, you know, feedlots just really stiffened their backbone and said, you know, we're going to attempt, we're going to try to get steady price prices this week. And then lo and behold, prices shot a dollar higher in the South and three to four dollars higher in the North. So it is a good day to be with you guys. And I'm excited to dive on into this drought conversation. And so let's go ahead and tackle the big elephant in the room. And that will be how do you navigate the cattle market amid drought, amid drought circumstances? And so I think we have to start this conversation with a few things, and we have to ask ourselves, where do we sit in the current cattle cycle? What are the short-term and long-term realities of the market, and what's our goal? And so that's what I'm going to walk you through here today. And so I guess I should probably introduce myself now that I'm already two minutes winded into this presentation, but I'm Shaley Stewart. I'm the Livestock Market Analyst for DTN. I, I cover the live cattle, feeder cattle, and lean hog markets for DTN and their customers. I share that information to those subscribers. Um, through DTN and I love my job. It is nothing short of a sheer blessing from God. And I'm very lucky. I get a, I get to tackle these matters day in and day out and work with people that uh, like doing the same. So um, some of you might have seen some videos that I share on Facebook on the platform called Cattle Market News. If you want to tune in to just a weekly recap, it's free there. And uh, nevertheless, you can stay attuned there. So getting back to those three questions, that's what I want to just kind of plant in your mind right from the get go. And you can ask me specific questions questions here later, but we're only supposed to take, you know, three to five minutes right now. So again, I just want to plant the seed of when we are navigating the cattle market through drought situations, we really need to think of these three points. Where do we sit in the current cattle cycle? And that's the question that I really want you to spend a lot of time thinking about, because I promise you that whatever drought strategy, whatever drought plan you drum up for this drought, this cycle, it will not be the same strategy and it'll not be the exact same plan that you use in the next drought. So with that, transitioning to the second question, we need to be very sober upon our valuations of the short-term and long-term realities of the market. 
That way you can capitalize on any opportunity to um, gain profits both here and now and then later in the future. And then you also need to be sober minded about what your goal is in the market. Do you plan on being a ranch that, you know, just simply makes a quick buck and you want to maybe let the cows go because it's a hassle that's bothering you? Or maybe you want to go ahead and have a legacy that you hand down onto your children and grandchildren. We need to be very sober minded about our own goals in this market. So with that, I'm going to go to go ahead and turn over the reins and let uh, the other experts share about their stories and what they have to offer today. And I'm so excited about being a part of this conversation. Thanks, guys. Grace, can you can you give your intro to the group? Sure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Grace Woodmancy, and I'm a Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor for um, Siskiyou County Cooperative Extension. Siskiyou County is in far northern California on the Oregon border. Um, and to get started with the introduction today, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background information about the research that informed the creation of the Drought Decision Support Tool that myself and my colleague Dan Macon developed. Um, and we'll be getting into more details on that later in the discussion. But um, just in terms of a background, my thesis focused on rancher decision making during uh, the 2012 to 2016 drought in California, which at the time was considered California's historic drought, but we're currently in a new historic drought right now. Um, so anyway, I worked with some cooperative extension colleagues to analyze a series of interviews that they conducted in 2016 right at the end of that, um, of that drought. We also looked at some surveys that were conducted in 2011, right before the drought took effect, which provided some really opportunistic baseline data to pull from. So we were really interested in looking at what worked and what didn't work for people that were managing through such historic conditions, and also at whether or not perspectives on drought planning changed between 2011 and 2016, after going through such a severe drought. So just in a nutshell, we found that more practices were adopted by ranchers between 2011 and 2016, um, which makes sense. But we also found that there was an apparent large increase in the adoption of individual proactive practices or planning in advance of a drought, not necessarily just responding during the drought, although there was plenty of that as well, because as I mentioned, conditions were very severe. Um, we also did find that there were shifts in um, rancher perspective that suggested that drought support really needed to be tailored to the individual needs of ranching operations. So some great information to inform our cooperative extension work, but when drought plans have to be tailored to the needs of individuals, that leads a lot of questions for how we respond as a support agency. So that kind of brings me back to um, my current position as an advisor for Siskiyou County. I've been here for just about a year now and started in the middle of our new historic drought in California and was noticing that a lot of the drought management tools for ranchers um, were kind of focused on the, the perspectives and production systems in other Western states, not as much um, for California ranchers. And of course we have pretty big differences in our, um, in our forage resor resources that drive differences in our California production system. So as many of you know, annual grasses are dominant in California, um, which means that a lot of our ranchers calve in the fall and winter on Central Valley rangeland um, and then move either onto irrigated pasture or up to mountain allotments during the summertime. So all of those kind of variables create a unique production system in California um, and also kind of creates a situation where the timing of our precipitation in California is almost more important than the quantity in some years. Um, that timing of precipitation really makes a difference in our annual systems. So we were wondering if our research could provide a jumping off point for a tool that was detailed enough to be useful, but open-ended enough to take all of these California specific variables into account. So, I collaborated with my um, colleague, Dan Macon, who's also a cooperative extension livestock and natural resources advisor to develop our drought decision support tool last summer. And I'll conclude with just what our goal of developing this tool was. Um, we really wanted it to evolve over time based on feedback from ranchers. So hopefully that tool is never really done because drought planning is never really done either. And I hope that today is just a starting point for this conversation. 
Um, we really welcome feedback on this tool. We wanna to make it better, more applied um, to the perspective of ranchers. And um, I look forward to learning from the other presenters and from the participants this evening as well. So thank you to Good Grazing Makes Sense for the opportunity. Thanks, Grace. Uh, just a check-in from MJ. We have uh, about 70 folks tuning into this, um, mostly from Western states, but a couple from Michigan and Canada. And I wanna encourage those folks from Michigan and Canada, uh, just because things are different over there, ask those detailed questions. I love to hear about what goes on uh, in other parts of the world. It, it makes me sleep a little bit better knowing that we're not the only ones in trouble. I've assumed Michigan and Canada, you are in drought there as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I'm going to turn it over to Martin for uh, an intro. Sure. Hey, guys. <clears throat> um, I apologize for my, my pickup background, but I'm actually at a Montana Extension Grazing Workshop in Grass Range, Montana right now. Uh, I got asked an interesting question today, which is how on earth does a Pheasants Forever biologist become a panelist on a Society for Range Management? drought conference and uh the answer i had for that is my position um is with the rancher stewardship alliance it's a, a rancher group based out of north central montana whose mission statement is ranching conservation and communities a winning team and what i do for them is i oversee their conservation program um, through that we work with around 60 different ranches actively on conservation plans that address wildlife needs that really just in practice turn into a, a, a ranch improvement project. So we do things like grass seedings and livestock pipelines and fencing. Um, and then as part of my position, I also track how many people I talk to in a given month. And so far in 2022, I am up over 200 different people that have asked me mostly about water systems. So uh, through those active projects and potential ones uh, across about a third of the state, um, I'm getting a pretty good view into people's decision making on uh, drought. So I, th I think the thing that I want to kind of cover today is decision making, action points, and trying to limit emotional decisions in drought planning. I think that's the biggest thing I'm seeing through the last year and a half is, is honestly just kind of some panic. Um, we, we set records for the worst drought ever in 2017. We broke those last year and we're working on breaking those again this year. So or we're not doing great in the five-year average, but I'm um, really trying to focus on things that you can control um, and making decisions that will benefit you both this year and next year, I think is something to think through. Um, with that, I work with a rancher and board member uh, named Dale Viseth that I have on here. He was having some Zoom difficulties and I see it bounced him off, so hopefully he can get back on, but I'll give a little background on Dale. Um, Dale is in South Phillips County. He will tell you his exact precipitation, but I'll give a good guess at it. I think it's less than about six inches in the last two years. Um, with that, he operates on, I think, nearly 80,000 acres um, and has water issues, fence issues, herd issues, water quality issues. He's, he's a source on every issue you could have. And his response to that is a detailed and planned out 15-step drought response plan. So I, I thought that was a an interesting response to drought that I, I wanted to see um, Dale share with other people and let, uh, I think Dale's a great resource to ask questions to. So I thought he would be good to have on. Um, and I think my last main point for my introduction is there's a, a phrase that I've been kind of taking to my project planning recently, which is there's never been a situation so bad that you can't do something to make it worse. Um, so trying to remember that anything we do in a drought has consequences and, and fallout going forward, I, th I think is important to remember instead of just reacting to how bad it is right now. Thanks. And if, uh, if Seth gets back on, can, uh, can somebody ping me? I, I'd, I'd sure like to pick his brain in person yep. too. Yeah, I'll throw I got a lot out of that. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, what I got from from the experts so far is is this is all about planning. This is all about not making rash decisions. So so obviously I want to go straight to the marketing person and tell me how I make my next rash decision. What are we doing with this market, and and what's my step today that I can I can start at least planning for the fall on how I take care of things. 
That's a good question. And I'm glad that you brought it up because that falls in line perfectly with understanding both the short-term and long-term realities of the market. And I think that is something that everybody, regardless of your location, regardless if you're in a drought situation or not, wants to know. And so let's go ahead and break that down into two steps. Let's talk about your short-term realities and the long-term realities of the market. Right now, the basically what I do on an every single day basis is I make a T-chart of the market. And I say, these are the things that are positively supporting the market. And these are the things that are negatively supporting the market or negatively weighing against the market. And so right now, the biggest headwind that we have is obviously corn prices, drought, inputs of any and all sources, and then also these record on feed numbers. And so obviously, as we, you know, trek through the first couple of days of June, and as we look to July and August, we know that the fall is nearing sooner rather than later. And that obviously, once we get to the fall, and once we get work through these record on feed numbers, that there is prosperity, that there are better prices to be had the market, but it's just juggling what do we do from now until then. And so right now, it's just kind of gritting our teeth and getting work through these record on feed numbers, getting, you know, your pairs through the summer with hopefully calves that are healthy and that are growing and you know treating your rangeland as appropriately and as stewards should but then once we get to fall i am so excited and i think that you know we can learn from the droughts in the past and i think that's so important but what's important to also understand is that we have cold we have cold rate right year to date 1.57 million had a beef cows and so that's 14 percent higher than what we had cold at this point in 2021 and that's 28 percent higher than the five-year average and so that has surpassed the number of beef cows that were cold in 2012 when we had a drought in the southern half of the United States, and that surpasses the number of cows that we had in the 80s, we are going to be looking at having as few as beef cows as we had in the 1950s. And so as you look to the fall, I hope that you are optimistic, and I hope that you are ready to capitalize on the market when given the chance. So what's what's keeping these, what's keeping these calls going so strong? Um, you know, we're talking about record calls going out mixed with drought, uh, and, and I'm not complaining, but how come we're still doing so good on the coal market? There's really two things that we can factor into really high coal demand right now. And number one, that's hamburger demand. As box beef prices have been astronomically high over the last two years, hamburger is what folks can afford. You know, people want to eat beef because it's, it's, it's an awesome product. It's, it's dense and nutritional value. It's delicious in its taste. But then second of all, the reason why coal cow prices are still as strong, not only because of beef demand, but then also because after branding season and people get, you know, get those coal cows marketed, how many coal cows are there going to be in the market to market? there aren't going to be many because all the cows that needed to go to town have already gone to town. And so it was funny. I was looking at some sale reports today and it doesn't matter where you look. And I know that not everywhere got moisture last week, but the, the shot of moisture that we got, you know, over Memorial day week and throughout the later part of that week, it really helped the market's overall environment and attitude and slaughter cow prices in Kansas. I was looking at a uh, winter livestock's report. They were up 10 to $12 higher and then get this slaughter bull prices were up anywhere from two to three three dollars higher and so i think that as packers are looking at this market they are realizing that you know what they have record on feed numbers but those calf fed fats are working their way into the market which is obviously affecting grading and so they're needing to gobble up these cows because once they're done once branding season is over the cows that needed to go to town have already gone through the market and there aren't going to be very many of them to be had i've, I've always assumed that the the, the coal run was in the fall and uh, I came up with this great solution to start culling during branding season. I, I thought I was the first one to think of it, but is, is that more typical than I might have thought? Is, is there more cows going to town during branding season than there, all, than there are after pregging? Well, one of the, yeah, I've had so many people ask me about this cold cow market and how, how to market cold cows, you know, should they put, should they put bulls back in with them? And instead of marketing them as open marketing them as breads, and you are right there, the lowest point in the cold cow market is the, is the fall and then the winter, but there are a lot of cows that still go to town in the early spring and summer, but that's just typically when the demand is the highest because of hamburger demand, because of grilling season, because everybody wants to get out on their deck, get out on their patio and, and you know, enjoy the American festival 
activities that we love, but then also because a lot of folks are wanting to get some rebreeds. So they're getting those cows, they're putting embryos in them or what have you, because maybe they can't get their hands on the other type of genetics that they want. And so the rebreed demand, rebreed demand, or, you know, taking those cows and giving them to somebody like Transova is really strong. So that's, that's why we see the, the cycle that way. I'm a train we live right by the train tracks. I hope you guys aren't getting caught up in that. Uh, thanks for that. I, I feel a little bit better uh, going into fall. Uh, I, I've been right. watching the board. I feel pretty good going into fall, but uh, okay. if, it, lately it feels like I've been making decisions like week to week, just trying to keep things going. You know, I can't, I can't uh, keep saying that we're, uh, you know, culling heavy, like we're, we're done culling heavy at this point. We're, Right. We're digging a lot deeper and it's, it's starting to affect our, you know, five-year plan. And, um, so, so moving away from that uh, decision by disaster situation, I, I'd like to, to go back to Grace and talk about your, uh, you know, how do we plan for these kind of things? So, so we're not as dependent on that coal market being lucky like we have been. Yeah, of course. Sorry, I've got a busy road right behind me too, so I've been on mute as well. Um, so I think that a, a drought decision support tool can offer a good starting point because this situation can be very overwhelming to parse apart. Um, drought impacts all aspects of an operation, so so trying to sit down and figure that out, understandably, can be very overwhelming. So. That's kind of um, the catalyst for why we developed a decision support tool, um, just to, to help walk people through some questions that they might not have considered or to use as a starting point for conversations between themselves and their families. Because as I mentioned in my introduction, this is definitely, definitely an iterative process. I, I think we all know that you don't stick with one drought plan over time. It will definitely evolve as conditions do. So um, I think that. Some of the things that we tried to prioritize in our, in our drought planning tool um, was really flexibility in, in balancing the forage supply and demand equation during a drought. That's really the pinch that people get in. So um, looking at economics to make that decision or to guide that decision, I think is really important. As Martin said, um, it's difficult sometimes to remain really objective during stressful events like drought, but relying on the economic piece to guide you can be really important as well. Um, and for that reason, as a part of our decision support tool, we've included some links to partial budgets that can walk people through some examples of um, the costs and kind of um, the costs and benefits of different strategies that they might consider. And then um, I think that we, we also devoted a pretty decent section of our tool just to um, outlining what your forage calendar might look like. And doing that in advance month by month will allow you to get ahead of where your gaps might be early so that that economic analysis can start as early as possible and that that can give you some more opportunities to be in control of the, of the decisions that you decide to make. Um, and I think Again, I would, I would just emphasize that um, not getting it right the first time in terms of drought planning doesn't necessarily mean you have a drought plan. It just means that you have a bad drought plan. It just means that you have more ranch specific data to inform next steps. And I think that's another reason why we really recommend that these plans are written down because it's very, very difficult to compare and build on something that's only in your head. So, in the work that I was describing earlier, we found that about 50% of ranchers had a written drought plan. So I think there's a really big opportunity there to just make sure that the plan that you have in your head is on paper so that over time that plan can evolve. That, that's true with a lot of things in the ranching business. If, if it's not written down, it really doesn't matter. It, it definitely doesn't span the generations when you don't share it with everybody <laughs> even if it is in your head if you don't even talk about it it's it's pretty tough i i see seth is uh sorry mc dale is back on i i'm sorry i may have called you seth earlier it's that name dale b seth uh you want to give us a, just a little bit of background martin uh martin filled in for you and gave you your your intro but uh can you talk just kind of briefly about 
what caused you to make that 15 step plan and like a high level view of what that looks like? Well, I would agree with Grace that uh, um, the more things that you have written down, planned, and things will just go a lot better. I found out over the years and drought in our neck of the woods is uh, fairly common. We're in a 12.5 inch rainfall zone here, but we keep weather records on the ranch for the last 62 years. And our variation goes from 22 inches to, to less than six and a half. And so you look like a pretty good rancher when you're in a 15 plus precip. And when you slip below that nine, things kind of fall apart. And I guess I just uh, wrote down some of the things that I thought worked well for me. I actually have uh, uh, comments uh, that my granddad made to me when I was just a kid. And I think I was eight or 10 years old. His first comment was that you should have uh, two years of hay and two years of grass in front of you because one of those, one of these years you'll need it. And I guess uh, uh, with that, I've kind of come with, I've kind of bounced in and out here. So I'd, I'd turn it back over uh, for any, any questions you had from me. We, we, uh, we have a question from the audience, but, but I'm the moderator and I get to, I get to ask the experts uh, all of my personal questions, I guess. Um, when you say have two years of grass ahead of you, what, I, that's, that's a lot of grass ahead of you. I mean, how do you keep yourself from filling that ranch up for the year and, and getting the new pickup? And I guess you just live through a, a few years that uh, you wish you had two years of grass in front of you because it, it gets very tough. And I guess and, I can and, remember. And when you say that two years, is that um, uh, two years worth of grass that can get an, at your, your, your bare minimum cow herd through, and at the end of that two years, it's smoked. There's just nothing left. That's, uh, that's what I, you're talking I, about. Not two years with enough to leave residual. Uh, I guess my, my uh, uh, the, the context my granddad meant, I, I think he thought if I was going to survive, he was a, uh, he'd lived through the thirties. They called them the dirty thirties up here. And we li literally had uh, wind storms, those kind of things. Uh, some of the uh, questions uh, or uh, one of the biggest conversations that the locals had was if the grass would ever grow again. And so that was from his his perspective because he he'd seen some very hard times. Mm -hmm. And I think for reference, just in this current drought, we have places now like garrison hayfields that are not growing. Um, so it it has gotten that bad again. Yeah. We we right. actually oops. quit. We actually have some uh, reservoirs on the ranch that date back to the 30s that were used for uh, water, household water for some of the community because it was all they had, and they're dry this year. So, so Martin, I'll get to you in a second, but first I want to address this question from Manitoba. We are proactively planning for the drought and reducing stocking rate. In May, we got two to 300% monthly moisture average. Question is, is the drought over or did we just have a wet month in a dry cycle? Martin, you wanna field that one? Sure, so um, I, I, Grace will probably touch on some more tools, but uh, an interesting tool that can kind of give you an insight to that. It takes a little bit of feedback time, but the the rangeland analysis platform tool is rangelands.app um, has a, a current growth cycle in it that calculates every 16 days. Um, and if you hold the, the bar graph on that, it'll show you your percent of average. 
Um, I was at a ranch uh, just last week where we got a little bit of rain and they were excited. We had some green and droughts over, but uh, it's, we went from a 40% of average year to a 51% of average year in the last 16 day cycle. So still a long ways from on top. Um, but where we're at in the season, and I'm, I don't, Manitoba might be wetter and cooler and grow a little longer, but we're about done for grass. We have stuff that's starting to go to seed that's about over. So at this point, rain keeps it green and keeps the quality up, but I don't think we're gaining any quantity. Um, so I think that's, that's the fear. I know rain is a great thing to get excited about, but I, it's, it takes a minute and it takes some conditions for it to add more grass. Yeah. So, so along those lines, that uh, phenological stage, state that you're in, if you've been in a drought for that long uh, and you maybe you've got a good flush of something, those seeds that come down and, and land on dirt that's been dry for so long and your soil moisture platform or uh, profile may not be very good. How viable are those, those seeds? I mean, how, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, feed production, are we gonna see a, a it step up exponentially or, or is it, is it going to take a while to, for conditions to be right to grow that grass again? Uh, I, Dale, you probably might disagree with me, but I think we're so cool season dominated, dominated for a seed to grow. It's not going to do anything real until next year. It's basically going to overwinter before it would ever sprout. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if seed making it to the ground has a benefit this summer. I, I it's, pretty perennial or the plants that are there this year, the plants this year, but maybe next year it might change. Dale, do you want to weigh in? Um, I, I guess I, I think Martin answered that well, that we're, we're basically cool season um, depending on on what it does from here on out that we probably aren't going to see a lot of a lot more growth or seedling starts uh, in this year. So I've been wanting to ask this question the whole time and I've been holding off, but the people are demanding it. We need a rundown of your 15 step plan. Uh, I guess I a uh, specifically from Montana. Okay. Well, I guess the uh, the first thing that I try to point out is that uh, um, we we need to plan for drought because just due to the variation, about two and ten years are going to be um, drought or 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 low enough production that we're going to be changed. I think uh, number two, I have uh, a well-planned grazing management system. I guess I personally prefer um, for a, a simple, simple uh, definition of this, it would be a, a twice over that we like to go over our pastures uh, as a time control when they're in active early growth. And then uh, as we come back, we will take the designated AUMs in the dormant season. I guess some of the um, things that the ranch does, and this, this not everybody would have these options, but we were able to take part in the CRP program. Uh, we like the, uh, the CRP program and continue to bid our lands in, um, not only for the income, but it gives us some more flexibility in these drought years. I guess one of the big things that uh, the ranch has always maintained, and I, I, I would say that a lot of people might call these marginal enterprises. And in this case, uh, we keep our, our uh, late calves over as yearlings 
and we'll run about a 200 head um, stalker grazing yearling. And when we feel pinched, that's the very first uh, relief valve that we go to that those, those cattle can be liquidated on the market anytime. And uh, uh, that will, will alleviate 15 or 20% of our, our grazing AUMs. And then I have uh, uh, managing uh, with insurance. I have two of those, your uh, rangeland insurance program that is, is basically a precipitation insurance um, and then uh, forage for your hay. Uh, in, in water, in drought situations, water is always uh, critical in any of your, your range management decisions, but becomes more so. And I guess uh, uh, we've, we've, on the ranch, we have about 150 permanent dugouts and reservoirs, but uh, we have a, about 75% of those are now dry. And so we have looked towards uh, pipelines and then we've actually got uh, into the water trucking business. We've got a couple of water tankers. And uh, I think anything that you can do portable, last year we put in about 39,000 feet of pipeline and with 18 different hydrants on it. But what was really killing us was trying to get all the tanks set. And so I have a article right here. We've bought two of them right now, but this guy has a portable 3000 gallon inventory with a 400 gallon drinker that you pick up with your bail bed. And that's really saved us this year because we just don't have time to, to put all those trawls in. And so I think anything that you can do that uh, keeps you flexible will really help. Um, I guess I hit the, uh, we've also gone to a solar pump for some of these dugouts that are very low. And that's, uh, it's, it's kind of spendy. It took about 6,000 bucks to get into it, but it's worked very well. We thought we were going to have to fence these reservoirs. If the cows don't have to get in the muck, they aren't going to. Uh, we just got to moving, moving this with our cow herd to our lowest level reservoirs. And they, they do very well unless you have problems with your tank. Um, they 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 pretty much you leave the your water source alone, and that that's really helped save some of these these uh, small small reservoirs. Uh, another item that I put on here, um, I think it's very critical to go through and test all your water and feed sources, and uh, um, uh, very high stress times. We haven't had running water for three years here. So we're, we're worried about water quality. We have had uh, some livestock deaths, not especially on the ranch, but in the community. And so I think you should take as many precautions as, as you can. I guess uh, my I have a take advantage of your uh, annuals, biannuals, weeds, anytime you get a flush, like we were talking about in Manitoba here, if we get some weeds, um, rotate to those. I guess one, one example I use that if I have cheap grass problems, I call what I, I do what I call a flash graze, that if you can hit that pre-heading, the cattle will actually select for it in our, our perennial cool season range ranges. And when they do that, we're, we're constantly moving our cattle. If we can hit, 
hit cheatgrass and move on to more cheatgrass and uh, save save the use on our perennials. We've also seen that with like uh, yellow sweet clover years. We always call it, uh, we'll rotate our pastures when we, we can't see the yellow. Sometimes the whole pasture looks yellow when you turn them in. You can't see the yellow anymore. You, you pull them off and get them into another one. Um, you, we're, we're looking to, to expand our, our uh, grazing our grazing areas as much as we can. So the stuff that is usually hayland, those kind of things goes into our grazing, our, 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 our uh, range program. And those AUMs or our hayland has to be made from something else, whether those cattle go are sold or go to feedlots in an area that isn't drought affected. Uh, dry cow, uh, you can reduce your feed requirements on a dry cow versus nursing cow by about 20%. And we always felt that feeding the calf directly was uh, would benefit your gain. So early weaning, anything like that. Culling strategies. Um, I guess my my comment here is our older animals first. Anything that's non-productive, like the grass cattle, um, usually the yearling heifers get dipped into. Um, it's a good time to clean up your herd for any functional or efficiency traits, udders, etc. cetera. Um, and I guess the last one I have is just implement best management practices for efficiency. And I, I have a, a vaccination program for cattle to minimize death loss, uh, formulate uh, rations, uh, crossbreeding program, um, select cattle for, uh, it's a fairly new test that they have, but residual feed intake, and that is where cattle gain more on less feed. And uh, use ionophores, growth promotants, those kind of things. That and unless you are, are paid uh, the opportunity cost not to use those things. And so I guess that was, it's all, all pretty common sense stuff. It was just written down on my, uh, um, my word processor. Um, and I had had the Mrs. Proof at a time or two, and if we get more ideas, we'll add to those uh, as as time goes along. And I guess I would I would ask anybody that uh, has some good strategies to come forward with those because I think peer to peer uh, is the best way that we can uh, get through these things. So I guess that's. I hope I didn't take too much time. That's that was my 15 point plan. I've, I've been waiting for over a year to hear this 15 point plan. Uh, it left me with about 150 questions, but uh, there's there's questions coming in from the, the chat that I'm gonna put out there. Um, you say it's a common sense plan, but you wrote it down and and you're living by it. That's That's great. That's not so common sense. I don't see that. Uh, from Avery in Wyoming, I've noticed blue grandma, a warm season grass, go to seed on the short grass prairie over the last couple of weeks. And signs like this for, for, from our forage be indicative of what we might be looking at in terms of drought. I'm going to put that out there to, to anybody. Maybe, maybe less of a California question, but feel free, Grace. No, I would agree. I think some of my other colleagues on here are probably better equipped to answer that question. But I will say that um, I've noticed that a lot of people have been using kind of phenology and, and indicators that are specific to their operation to um, almost as a trigger for what they're going to plan for in terms of a drought. So I think Avery brings up a really good point in 
what that trigger could mean for, for her operation. I, I think one of the, I think one of the things I didn't get in here was uh, trigger dates. And I think that's very important to put in your plan is to have action uh, procedures and maybe Grace's or someone else has already gone over that, but that's my, my plan is limiting in those. And I would certainly recommend that you have those. That, that definitely from outside of uh, my comfort zone. Anybody else from that part of the world want to dig deeper into that one? I think I'd, I'd just add in that usually when a, a grass goes to seed, that means it's about done. Um, so I, I think you're on that. Yeah, that's probably a, an indication of how much it's going to do this year. Uh, there's a yeah. few species that you get some rain, they, they go some more. Uh, like western wheatgrass is one if but it's it's super species dependent so i i want to know what your range is dominated by and what chance those have of adding a lot of production with rain uh, from michigan do you see an increase in invasive woody type plants and do you spray or change culture practices to deal with them that that's Something I'm seeing, you know, we uh, what's out there has definitely changed, and it's episodic. But uh, yeah, how, how much do you change if it is just episodic? Do you do you line up the the chemicals or, or change your change your grazing rotation based on those changes that you see out there in the feed? Um, so I'd throw a stupid joke out there. Uh, a ranch I was at a couple weeks ago, I. I looked around and I was like, do you usually have this much leafy spurge? Like we don't have a ton of leafy spurge in the County. And I, this was everywhere. The uh, rancher looked at me. He's like, well, you know, whatever stands up, stands out. And it was the tallest thing out there. So it, <laughs> it was noticeable. Um, so I know like Woody's especially um, can definitely take over whenever they get a chance to like where we're at, we have issues with conifers on after years with a lot of fall moisture get started and really take off. Um, so yeah, I'm sure just basically the, the opening, um, if grasses aren't taking the space they usually do is, is something that contributes to that change. And as far as a management change, um, I, I don't know enough about Minnesota to have any idea, but it's, it's so weather driven. It's hard to respond quickly or cattily in a very timely manner. Yeah. In, invasives do what invasives do. They're gonna they're gonna keep coming. Uh, and to to add one more thing to the list of things you got to pay for that chemical and that uh, just just the cost of changing anything. That it's a tough time to do it, but it might be your your best and early shot on on getting ahead of those invasives. Uh, I have a tough time coming up with with more money for herbicide in a year like this, but. But personally, I, I'm doing more spraying this year than I have in other years. Um, not just to get ahead of it, but um, it's so droughty that even the invasives are struggling in some places. That they're popping up uh, maybe in new places, but it's just so bad out there that even even cheatgrass is having a hard time. So I'm sucking it up, taking advantage of of that uh, that opportunity, and, and trying to beat them back. Um, you know, I might be able to afford more chemical uh, later this fall, hopefully. But uh, right now, to me, is the, is the chance to get ahead of it. And, and I would say I've, I've almost tripled what we're putting out there in terms of uh, herbicide this year. And I hope it works. I know Nevada is a lot different than, than Michigan. From Sarah in Oregon, I would be interested in more info on the solar pump. We can draw livestock water from a local river, but access with a conventional pump is difficult. And that I took some notes on that too when you were talking about that, Dale. Uh, that's a great idea that never really occurred to me. You want to stop beating up those those sweet spots in the drought, just pump it out to a different location. What uh, what's your typical setup like? I know you talked about being very portable. Um, 
what's a typical setup on your outfit like? Uh, the, the, the one we have, we have uh, a 2,500 gallon tank. It's a steel homemade one. And we have our solar panels on top of it. And we haven't uh, uh, tested it for how much lift we have. We get about 10 gallons a minute with a minimal lift. And we've been, been very pleased with it. There again, we've just been, um, our, our reservoirs are very low and boggy. And so we put our, our pump in and uh, uh, we haven't been running it that far, probably, probably a couple hundred feet from the, the reservoir. And we'll, we thought we were going to have to fence it. We haven't. So it, it's worked very well. Um, there, uh, I guess you'd have to go to the internet. There are several uh, people that are working uh, with solar pumps. One of my neighbors is uh, pumping water with a solar pump uh, from his reservoirs lower in the drainage to tanks up above. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that myself, but they're using it, using it for a distribution tool. And uh, I guess with our solar pump, we actually felt that we could uh, use it as a distribution tool too, because the cattle like the pump water. They'll, they'll select for that. And I, I wish yeah. I had yeah, yeah. accessible pictures, but I'll, I'll make sure I send them over if, um, for the reference. But we, we do a lot of different projects with weird solar things. So we have quite a few projects where we've put a, like a stagnant, solar pump in at a reservoir and then like pumped it to storage to go to other tanks. Uh, we have other people that have taken like pickup box trailers and mounted a solar panel in that. And then they, they can store all the, the, the tubing and pumps and cords in that pickup box trailer and tow that around to like reservoirs or, or creeks to pump into like portable tanks. Um, some we're within sight of Canada. So a lot of our stuff comes out of Canada. So like Sundog Solar is a company out of Canada that does a lot of kind of custom setups for that Ramcat portable tanks is they're a, a canvas quick fold tank that a lot of people have been using that drains fast and can be moved when cows are moved. Um, and we also have a lot of people that, that uh, kind of what Dale said on quality, even not in the drought have been using those just for the, the water quality benefit. So uh, it's definitely an interesting thing to look into that I, re I really like doing as part of projects. I, I feel I feel pretty dumb. I obviously making that portable. If you're gonna want to go to all that expense, why not take the extra step and make it portable? It, these droughts really show the weak spots in a ranch. And I have been running around for the last year and a half, just throwing money at improving our water systems, which is good. But I really should have taken some of that money and invested in some more portable situations and. Uh, I'm I'm going to take that with me tomorrow and and really think on that. Yeah. Obviously, nothing's cheap right now. Um, and and going solar, you know, what a, what a great time to go solar when uh, we're in the middle of a drought and fuels it. I don't know what it's like everywhere, but we're looking at close to six dollar diesel here, and uh, those pumping costs really don't pencil. Yeah. So actually, the last project I contacted. Uh, well, uh, I, I thought I'd have to be the bad guy and ask all my questions, but you guys are asking the questions I want to ask too. And <laughs> Daniel, uh, and I'm not sure where, from a cattle market standpoint, do I wait and only sell pairs if I absolutely have to, or do I bring them to the sale barn now and hope I don't lose? Can you say that again? You cut out just for one second. I think I heard the gist of your question. I think that the question was, do you wait and sell pairs now or or take them later? Is that the question? Yeah, I'm, I'm back on right now. We have a, a brief uh, freeze up. Or do I bring them to the sale barn now and hope I don't lose? It's hard to get a solid estimation of what prices will be for pairs from week to week. And, and who knows if they, even, they may go in as pairs. 
but I've been seeing cattle come in as pairs and not leave as pairs. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. And honestly, just with that information, I think that I have to ask more questions before I can give a, a sober, you know, uh, analysis of what you should do. But I guess if I was in the situation of having pairs and I didn't know what to do with them because my grass was short, I would look at doing a couple of things. I would ask you, do you have the availability to um, carry financially these cattle until a different point in time? Or is money dried up and you don't have that option and you simply need to get rid of them? If you have the option, you might look at, you know, moving them. Maybe you have somebody that you can, you know, pick up a lease because they let it go. Maybe you can put them in a feedlot, what have you. And then if, if that's not an option and you do have to market those pairs, I would tell you to go where the green is. And so where do not market your pairs in a region where drought is already present. I know that freight that fuel is expensive and that freight is costly, but if you're able to move those cattle into regions where there is grass, where there is feed available, it'll serve you dividends and you will see exponentially higher prices. And so in regards to the timing factor, you know, if you are up against the gun and you do have to market pairs right now, one thing that you do have working in your favor is that some folks in the country have gotten moisture over the last couple of weeks. And so this pair market, I, I tend to agree. I don't think that they'll go in depending on what those calves weigh, but I mean, they're peeling calves off cows, just, you know, a couple of days old. And so I don't believe that they'll probably sell as pairs. So uh, maybe you can market a couple, a couple, you know, different options there. But my, my advantage to you would be is that this market is going to get stronger. And so if you have any flexibility at all, I would really recommend that you to maybe talk to your banker and see if he's got any bit of uh, leeway that he can give you, but this market is going to get stronger. And so if you can hold out for any reason, I, I think it would pay you dividends. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a good point. Uh, just just because you have pairs doesn't need, mean they need to stay pairs. You know, you might you might find right. a way around that. Maybe maybe you do some super early weaning. I oh man, I was thinking about weaning some two hundred pound calves the other day, and I decided against it, but it. It was a thought we had, maybe, you know, maybe we just, we need super early, keep those calves until the fall when the market gets a little stronger, take advantage of uh, uh, some of these cows when they're, the, when they've been on the greenest feed we've had in quite a while. Um, but right. uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, think beyond what you usually do, you know, just because you have some pairs and you're in drought, doesn't mean you need to take your pairs to your local sales barn. Uh, yeah. You know, think outside of the box in that marketing. And, um, and I, I'm getting the message that, uh, uh, final question. So uh, what I really wanted to talk about uh, is changing up your calving dates, but um, you know what? Nobody can stop me. Let's talk about changing up your calving dates and then I'll get to that final question. What, what do we do about this? Uh, out here, you know, outside of California, um, we all calve at the same time. We all send these, calves to market at the same time um, from a marketing standpoint or your grass standpoint um, maybe maybe it's time for some of us to consider uh, you know calving a little bit later you know we, we all we hear a lot about it calving in sync with nature that kind of stuff um, from a marketing standpoint how do you see that uh, going over I think it's a wonderful question. And I think that more people need to consider it right now in the U S about 75% of the, the cow herds in the U S calve in the spring, or it's more like winter, you know, calving anywhere from January to April. And so when you have 75% of your market supplying feeder cattle, then in, you know, September through October, it's market econ 101, obviously supply outweighs demand and prices, you know, are softer, they're weaker. You're not going to get the exponential prices that you're hoping for. Now, the only thing that I would caution you is, is that fall, fall calving isn't a, you know, isn't a, uh, is it, isn't an option for everybody where we're at, that would take so much feed in order to carry those pairs over from, you know, let's say October into, you know, April, Well, we have some friends, we actually had to do some, you know, drought decision-making and we sent some pairs to Nebraska, they fall calve and it works beautifully for them. And they're able to capitalize on the market when there's fewer calves or, or feeders present in the spring and sell then. And it, it's been absolutely wild for them. They've seen stronger prices. Their calves are healthy 
here, but they are in a region where grass really isn't an issue. They're in a, a beautiful place in the court in the sand hills, and that just has worked beautifully for them. But given where my husband and I are here in Cody, Wyoming, that wouldn't be an option for us. And so I think if you have the availability to do so, I would I would say jump for it because obviously the market's economics of supply and demand would weigh in your favor. But I would caution those who are considering it and saying you really need to put the pen to pencil with that because your inputs are going to be different than what uh, the current situation is that you're running. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people would say, if, if you can't afford to do that, maybe you have the wrong type of animal. Um, right. So, so Martin, from a rangeland perspective, what's that going to do to our, uh, to our rangelands when, when we change the nature of when we, when we increase that cow's nutritional demands and when we decrease it, I, it's going to do exactly that. I mean, if, if you're, you're hitting lactation and you're, you're looking for a huge increase in forage intake, you have to have the forage to supply it. I mean, I, that's why a lot of us are forced to feed what we do and we have to feed what we do. If you're, you're a winter calver, I'm my, my in-laws work for a ranch that calves in January and they feed 50 plus pounds of hay, uh, the end of January to be able to do that. So, um, you have to be able to meet those needs. So I, I know that's I, some people that have tried fall calving in Montana have had some issues meeting those needs if we don't get a fall green up. Um, so that's, that's something to kind of watch out for, but knowing your, your really, I mean, managing in drought is knowing your grass inventory. So it's, it's just another variable added into what it takes to know your grass inventory. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm getting the hook. I've got uh, one final question uh, that we can fit in. Uh, how important is maintaining that ground cover and litter? Uh, and, and what kind of consideration should we put into that? Uh, I, I can tell you right now, I'm putting less and less consideration into it every day, but um, you know, do, do we come off that earlier? Do we come off that ground earlier to leave more, more litter or do we just smoke it and hope for the best next year? I guess I can jump in with one quick thought first. I think that as we see droughts across the West increase in severity and duration and frequency, um, keeping an eye out for the next drought being right around the corner is really important. And in that way, prioritizing your um, resilience of your forage resources is really, really important as well. I know that rangelands and ranchers have evolved with drought. It's always been a part of the ranching equation, but um, yeah, just the way we see these droughts increasing lately, I think that we have to not just think about surviving the current drought, but recovering as quickly as possible so that we're not going in short during the next drought and making sure that forage and soil resources are prioritized in that way. So um, I bet Martin has some good thoughts to add to that. So I'm actually pretty glad I'm in an extension function right now because we've actually had a slide on the board about this today. Um, one year is really no big deal. Uh, two years is a little questionable. Um, and by the third year, this was a, a stubble height study and even corrected for precipitation on the third year of basically taking too much grass, they're showing a, a a delayed growth curve. So basically it was taking longer to make it to the same amount of growth. It wasn't necessarily starting to grow less, but it was starting to hold it back. Um, so it's kind of like we said throughout and at the beginning, it's, it's, it's maybe not a huge deal this year, but you have to remember next year comes around. Okay. The hook is getting deeper. No, no. My boss said, I have one more question here. That, I, that we have time for, if I want, she says. If an operation does not have any hay on hand for the upcoming winter and will not be able to put up any hay this summer, does it make sense to buy $300 hay or just sell cows and calves in the fall and buy back next spring? Next spring, or I'm gonna add to that when the market's ready again, because that's a, that's a fantastic question. I don't know where that came from, but thank you. I'm going to jump in on 
on that one because I have had this question presented to me so many times and I understand that there are two sides of the sword here. You know, paying for $300 hay is just absolutely insane. But at the same time, we, we learn from the spankings that we took in 2012, 2013, and then 2014. And I really wanna encourage each and every one of you, there was a study done by Harlan Hughes of North Dakota State University on this exact matter. And it was, he did this study on a 250 cow head cow calf uh, operation and basically the rancher was up against the scenario in which we are right now they had a drought they put up hay he historically had kept about 50 replacement heifers and pulled some old cows out out of his herd each and every year and he didn't know what to do and so harlan ran the numbers and so basically one point that that was highlighted in the study is that the largest negative cash flow impact comes from destocking is actually in the year following the drought and so earlier I made the point that we need to assess and we need to understand clearly where we sit in this cattle cycle. And so, you know, if we were in a year where cow prices, you know, were sorry and we didn't expect these feeder cattle to do anything, I tell you, you're probably crazy for buying $300 a ton hay. But given where we sit in the cycle of supply and demand and the sheer numbers of cows that have left this market, I'm here to tell you that these feeder cattle prices are going to get astronomically higher. And I'm not going to stick my neck out on the line and say we're going to see 2014 all over again, but I'm here to tell you it's going to be good it's going to be sweet and it's going to justify some pretty darn expensive hay yeah I, i'm i'm with you all the way on that not not only do i see a huge market for the feeder calves coming up but <clears throat> if, if cows get anywhere near where they were we won't have a cow left on the place i mean if we got to yeah. stick 300 ton hay into her i, I want that return yeah like quite a bit um, I want to thank all the panelists who join us. Everybody, uh, Dale, did you have something? I was just going to say that uh, they might consider off off uh, ranch eating, as in a feedlot or something like that. That somebody in a, a good area might be able to do that more reasonable than they they do. But go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hear that answer a lot when I listen to podcasts from a little farther east than us. Uh, that option sure doesn't seem to exist in Nevada, but it, there must be something to it because I hear a lot of uh, Montana, Wyoming folks uh, headed to head closer to the Corn Belt, uh, and they can get their cattle through that way. And uh, it's, it's sure not the case in Nevada. I'd, I'd like to check that out. Thank you all for coming, uh, and and to those of us, those of you who joined us uh, through Facebook and YouTube, I appreciate the questions. Uh, this is good grazing makes sense if you like this. This is what we're all about doing. Uh, go to the website, www.goodgrazing.org to learn more about our program and benefits. Uh, this, is, this is just one of the things we do. I've had a really good time. I could, I could do this for another hour, easily just sit here and talk cows and grass. Um, but uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks for joining the panel, everybody. Uh, again, membership is uh, $50 if you're with an affiliated member, uh, such as U.S. Cattle Association, uh, $75 to non-partnering members. You get the SRM membership. You get access, pretty unfettered access to uh, experts like these. Uh, uh, Shaley, I don't know if, if you're one of those experts. I, I, if you're not, I sure hope you would consider becoming one of those experts. But um, there's, there's a list of 40 rangeland consultants that you have uh, that you can just pop in a question while you're driving around in the field. You have a question. Um, just just lots of great resources in terms of videos and content and uh, live interaction with with people who can help you. Uh, that's www.goodgrazing.org. Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up and uh, we will see you at the next next one of these. Good night.